We'd like to welcome you each along this morning. We'd like to welcome those that are viewing this program on your TVs or on your computers. We trust that you will receive a blessing. And so this morning, our life story is the story of a man by the name of Gideon. Now in Gideon's time, many of God's people had gone off the track. They were bowing down to idols of wood and stone. They'd turned their backs on the commandments of God. And a tribe of people by the name of Midianites came and made it hard for God's people for seven years. They, uh, they took their crops when they got ripe. They uh, took their sheep. They stole their sheep. They stole their oxen. They stole their donkeys. And so God's people were doing it tough. And the Bible tells the story where a man by the name of Gideon had a little bit of grain and he was, he was um, thrashing it there in the wine press, trying to do what he was doing secretly so these Midianites wouldn't see him. And something special happened while he was there. The record says the angel appeared and spoke to Gideon. The Lord is helping you and you are a strong warrior. Gideon said to him, If I may ask, sir, why has all this happened to us if the Lord is with us? What happened to all the wonderful things that our fathers told us the Lord used to do? How he brought them out of Egypt. I guess Gideon reminded him of how the Lord had opened up the Red Sea and brought the people through on dry ground, how he'd drowned the Egyptians as they tried to follow after, how he'd given them manna in the desert and brought water out of the rock. The Lord has abandoned us, Gideon said, and left us to the mercy of the Midianites. Now it's interesting that sometime before this, The Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites with this message. I am the Lord God of Israel, so listen to what I say. You were slaves in Egypt, but I set you free and led you out of Egypt into this land. And when nations here made life miserable for you, I rescued you and helped you get rid of them and take their land. I told you not to worship Amorite gods. That's the original Canaanite gods. Even though you are living in the land of the Amorites. But you have not obeyed my voice. Instead of serving God and keeping his commandments, there they were worshipping idols. Now let me ask the question this morning, ladies and gentlemen. What got the Israelites into trouble? It was disobedience. What gets us into a lot of trouble? Disobedience. The same thing, isn't it? Well, then the Lord himself said, Gideon, you will be strong because I'm giving you the power to rescue Israel from the Midianites. And Gideon replied, but how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest one in Manasseh and everyone else in my family is is more important than I am. In other words, Gideon said, Really? Are you going to give me the help to rescue Israel? Don't you know I'm a nobody? My tribe's the least one. My family's the least one of that tribe. I'm a nobody, Lord. It's interesting in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 553-554, it says, There are few 
who can be trusted with any large measure of responsibility or success without becoming self-confident and forgetful of their dependence upon God. This is why in choosing instruments for his work, notice this, the Lord passes by those whom the world honours as great, talented and brilliant. God often chooses nobodies and does a great work for, for, uh, through them. Sometimes the brilliant people, sometimes the greatly educated people. God can't work through them because they won't depend upon him. God doesn't need powerful, brilliant people, but what he needs is willing, dedicated people. And so the good news is, if you are willing, God can use you. Whether or not you can read or write, no matter how educated you are or what your lack of education is, if you are willing and dedicated, God can use you. The Lord answered, you can do it because I will help you. You will crush the Midianites as easily as if they were only one man. Well, poor old Gideon, he's got his questions. He said, show me a sign. He said, just hold on a minute, would you? Could I go and prepare something for you to eat? And so the angel of the Lord said, that's okay. And so Gideon ran away quickly and he prepared some food. And when he came back, the angel of the Lord said, just pour it out there on that rock. And the angel of the Lord went with his rod and touched it. And there it just all burned up. It was indeed a sign of God's power. This messenger was a heavenly messenger and what he said was true and it would happen. That same night the Lord said to Gideon, take a bull from your father's herd, a bull that is seven years old. Tear down your father's altar dedicated to the god Baal and cut down the pole dedicated to the goddess Asherah that is next to it. Then in the proper way, build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this fortified place. Take this second bull and sacrifice it as a burnt offering on the wood from the Asherah pole that you have cut down. And so Gideon was told, you go forth and you build an altar to God and you sacrifice your father's bull on that altar. And so there he took his father's bull and there he offered it as a sacrifice. Now it's very interesting you read the story. It says Gideon chose ten of his servants to help him and they did everything God had said. But since Gideon, look at this, but since Gideon was afraid of his family and the other people in town, what did he do? He did it all at night. Dear friends here this morning, maybe some of you have stepped out to follow Jesus, but you're afraid of what your family thinks. You're afraid of what your neighbours think. Dear friends, have courage. God is with you and he will help you. But there Gideon did it, but he did it at night so nobody would see him. Reminds me of a story in the New Testament where Nicodemus came along to see Jesus but he came at night because he didn't want other people to see him talking to Jesus. But friends, stand up for Jesus. Are we afraid sometimes to let others see us stand up for Jesus? Oh, friends, have courage and stand up. Well, in the morning when they came, and they saw the altar of Baal knocked down and, and another altar there. They asked each other, who did this? But Joash, Gideon's father, stood up to the crowd pressing on him. By the way, some of the people said, whoever did this should be put to death, whoever broke down Baal's altar. And Joash, Gideon's father, stood up to the crowd pressing in on him. He said, are you going to fight Baal's battles for him? Are you going to save him? Anyone who takes Baal's side will be dead by morning. If Baal is a god in fact, let him fight his own battles and defend his own altar. 
And so it's interesting, when you stand up for God, when you stand up for the commandments of God, when you stand up for right, often other people will stand up and support you. Isn't that right? And there his father had been off the track, but when he saw Gideon, he knew he, Gideon was on the right track and he defended him. Well, you know, poor old Gideon, he's still doubting that God can use him to overthrow these Midianites. And so he says, do you think you could give me another sign, God? And so God very graciously, well, he requested, he said, look, I'll take this fleece and I'll put it out. Uh, uh, and he said, if you're really going to help me overthrow the Midianites, in the morning I want the ground to be all dry and the fleece sitting on it to be wet. And sure enough, next morning when he got up, that's exactly what it was like. But then he got thinking, he thought, maybe, maybe the fleece has attracted the water, the dew, and maybe it's, uh, you know, just happened that way that it's wet and the ground is all dry. So he said, God, if you don't mind, could you give me another sign? And this time, if the, fleece could be, um, if the fleece could be dry and the ground all around it wet. And that's exactly what happened. God did that. And so Gideon was now ready to go forth to overthrow the Midianites. And so Gideon and his army, they are gathered down by the Harrod uh, Spring there. And there is the little stream there today, the Inherod stream. And so the Midianites, were, uh, the, the Israelites were down here, and the Midianites were out on this flat plain over there near the hill of Morah, all camped over there. And the Lord said, Gideon, your army is too big. I can't let you win with this many soldiers. The Israelites would think that they had won the battle all by themselves and that I didn't have anything to do with it. And so God said, those who are fearful and afraid, you tell them to go home. Leave the army and go back. Well, 22,000 left. They were afraid and so they headed home. And poor old Gideon only had 10,000 soldiers left. Then the Lord said to Gideon, you still have too many men. What? The Midianites, they had 135,000 men. And now Gideon's only got 10,000 left and God is saying, you still got too many, Gideon. Gideon scratching his head and thinking, how can this be? How can I ever overthrow this Midianite mob? And so God told him what test to give to those 10,000 people to test which ones were to stay. They were to go down to the water and it's what I call the dog test. God ordered the dog test. Those that those that got down like a dog and put their head down to the water and drank, God said, send all those home. Those that just knelt down and they lapped like that, he said, you keep those ones. What happened? Only 300 passed the test. Oh, things seem to be getting worse for poor old Gideon. You think 135,000 Midianites and now you've just got this little mob of Israelite soldiers. 22,000, 10,000 left and then he only had 300, I mean I should say 22,000 left, he had 10,000 and now he's only got 300. A bit like if I gave you $150 and then said you got too much. And so we take $102 from you and then you've got 47 left and we say you still got too much and so in, your, in the end you've only got five cents left. What would you think? $150 and now I'm down to five cents. I mean people say today you can't do anything with five cents and it's pretty true, isn't it? 
And Gideon would have felt that with his 300 men. He could say, well, what can I ever do to make an impact on those Midianites? Then the Lord said to Gideon, oh, here's the directions. I've already told you with the 300 men. Oh, no, sorry. With the 300 men who lapped water, I will save you and hand Midian over to you. God was confident that it could happen with those 300 men. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 549, it says, Success does not depend upon numbers. God can deliver by few as well as by many. He is honoured not so much by the great numbers as by the character of those who serve him. It's a very significant statement. Well, God is good. God understands our hearts. He understands our nervousness in standing up for Him. He understands the opposition we face. He understands our doubts and our questions. And so God was out to encourage Gideon. Notice what happened. That night, the Lord said to Gideon, Get up. Attack the Midianite camp. I'm going to let you defeat them, but if you're still afraid, you and your servant Pura should sneak down to their camp. When you hear what the Midianites are saying, you'll be brave enough to attack. And so Gideon and Pura worked their way to the edge of the enemy camp where soldiers were on guard duty. The camp was huge. The Midianites, Amalekites and other eastern nations covered the valley like a swarm of locusts. And it would be easier to count the grains of sand on a beach than to count their camels. <laughs> you think about that. You know, there their numbers were just like the locusts. Have you seen a locust plague or a grass, grasshopper plague? You know, and they're just... The, the, the air is just full of them. They're just hopping everywhere. And here, here they said, um, those, those Midianites, the enemy, are just like grasshoppers, like locusts covering the country. But they said they're camels. They've got more camels. It'd be easier to count the grains of sand on the seashore than count the camels. So they must have had a huge mob of camels. I was out at Pipple Jarra community, right up in the south, uh, in the north um, west corner post of South Australia. And these are wild camels that have come into an Aboriginal community. Look at them, just all wandering around there. That was the biggest mob of camels I'd ever seen in a community. But they came in because it was dry time and they were looking for water. But anyway, when Gideon got there, he sneaks down, him and his servant, to the edge of the camp. And when they got there, he heard a man telling his friend a dream. The man said, I had a strange dream. There was a loaf of barley bread rolling around in the camp of Midian. When it got to the command post, the loaf of bread hit that tent so hard that the tent collapsed, turned upside down, and fell flat. His friend replied, It's the sword of the Israelite, Gideon, son of Joash. It can't mean anything else. God has given him victory over Midian and our whole army. As soon as Gideon heard about the dream and what it meant, he bowed down to praise God. Then he went back to the Israelite camp and shouted, Let's go! The Lord is going to help us defeat the Midianite army. God had to give Gideon a lot of encouragement. But at last he was ready to go and he confidently went forward. He divided the 300 men into three companies. He gave each man, this, uh, this is their weapons. Look at it. He gave each man a trumpet and an empty jar and a torch in the jar. You say, well, what strange weapons to go to battle with. I mean, numbers, he's gone right down. He's only got 300 men and now he's got these strange weapons of war. A trumpet, an empty jar and a torch. Gideon said, watch me and do what I do. 
When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly what I do. When I and those with me blow the trumpets, you also, all around the camp, blow your trumpets and shout, For God and for Gideon. And so the men went forth. And there they followed what Gideon did. At the right time, they blew the trumpets. And then they, they broke their, their, their jars and the light shone. And then they shouted for God and for Gideon. And you know what happened? It says every man stood in his place around the camp, that is the Israelites, and the whole enemy army ran away yelling. They thought that God, that, that Gideon had hired enemy soldiers and they thought the biggest mob were coming and they panicked and they took off killing each other as they went. It was a tremendous victory for Gideon. God did for him exactly what he said he would do. He would help him to defeat these enemy people that had been making life so hard for the Israelites for so many years. God used means that you would have thought impossible to, to use to defeat the enemy. God is in the business of conquering giants and of solving hard problems. If only we'll trust in him, he'll work it out, right? Yes. Now what are some lessons that we can learn from this story, do you think? I'd like to think that we can learn that we get into a lot of trouble when we forget God's commandments. You know, God's commandments are like a wall of protection around us. The Apostle Paul in Romans 7 verse 12 says, The commandment is holy and just and good. But when we break those commandments, we get ourselves into a lot of trouble like God's people did in Gideon's day. Another lesson is that we have a big enemy, the devil and sin. Just like they had a big enemy, the Midianites and the Amalekites, we have a big enemy, the devil and sin, and they rule over us and they rob us of the good things of life, just like the Midianites were robbing the Israelites of their food and their animals and so on. But I want to tell you this morning, dear friends, the good news is that Jesus has conquered the devil. The devil is a defeated foe. The wicked angels, the angels, I should say, that chose to go with dev the devil, the devil and those angel, angels have been cast out of heaven. Jesus has defeated them. In the book of Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14 it says, We are people of flesh and blood. That's why, that is why Jesus became one of us. And look at this. He died to destroy the devil who had power over death. Yes, the Lord Jesus came and he died for, to save us from our sins. But there the Bible says he came to destroy the devil. To bring an end to his reign of sin and to bring an end to the trouble that he brings upon us. And our other big enemy, sin. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3 says, Christ died for us. When Jesus died on the cross, he died in our place for our sins. He died so that our sins could be washed away, so that we could be cleansed by his blood. Jesus took our punishment so that we might receive his life. 1 John 1, 9, But if we confess our sins to God, he can always be trusted to forgive us and take away our sins. Are you a big sinner? Are you a little sinner? Whatever sort of sinner you are, the good news is that if you confess your sin to God, He can always be trusted to forgive you and to cleanse you, to make you clean. Isn't that good news? Dear friend here this morning, you don't have to carry your sins around on your back. Yes, we've all done things that we're embarrassed about. We've all done things that we're, we wish we'd never done. They've 
hurt people and we feel bad about it, we feel crushed about it, but friends, give them to Jesus. He has said that he will forgive us and take them away and cleanse us. I tell you, that's good news. There are other enemies that so often give us a hard time. I don't know what your enemies are this morning, but the devil will make sure that you've got some enemies, some things, in other words, that are making it hard for you to be a Christian. The devil wants you to slip off the track so you will miss out on heaven. And so make no mistake about it, he will be putting some problem, some test in front of you to try to slip you up. For some people, their enemy is alcohol. For others, it's gambling. For others, it's tobacco. For others, it's the gunja, the drugs. There's all sorts of traps that the devil has got, all sorts of enemies that he's, that he's grown up to trap you and to hurt you and to, and to stop you on your way to the kingdom of God. And these things rule over us and rob us of the good things of life. Yes, sad these things that the devil has invented to rob us of happiness and to destroy our lives. But the good news is that Jesus will free us. Do you feel powerless to throw off these strong and cruel enemies? You mightn't have a problem with alcohol, but your neighbour here might. You might have some other problem that you are feeling the weight of, that you're finding hard to throw off. Do you feel powerless and helpless? Even though you feel weak, God can help you just as he helped Gideon throw off the Midianites. Do you believe that? Yes, he will. Trust in God and obedience to his will are as essential to the Christian in the spiritual warfare as to Gideon and Joshua in their battles with the Canaanites. What does it say? We need trust in God and we need to be obedient to His will. If you want the victory, you need to trust in God. You need to be willing to be obedient to His will. He is just as willing to work with the efforts of His people now and to accomplish great things through weak instrumentalities. This is another lesson we can learn from this story. Weak people, people that haven't got a lot of talents and a lot of abilities, God can use you to do great things if you're willing, if you're willing to let him use you. Gideon was a shy man. But God used him to do mighty things. God is waiting to use you to do mighty things for him. And our Aboriginal people all over this land need to hear the message of Jesus and be ready for his coming. And all other races of people, whether you're African or Filipino or, or, or Spanish or whatever you are, God is wanting peoples of all races to hear the message of Jesus and to be ready for his soon coming. God doesn't need a big mob of people. God can use a small group of committed people to do a big work. The story of Gideon gives us confidence to believe that. The question is, will you let him use you? Are you willing to let God use you. You know, one of the prayers that my wife and I pray most mornings as we go about our work, we pray, Lord, lead me today to the people you want me to, to see. Lead them to us. Help us to be in the right place at the right time to connect with the people you want us to connect with. You pray that prayer and it's amazing who God will bring into your pathway that day. And the opportunities you'll have to share Jesus. You sincerely pray and God will lead you to people and he will use you in a wonderful way. Here's my friend Lorraine Ferguson up there in Port Augusta. 
Well, the rain's on the bus coming down for the baptism here this afternoon. But Lorraine Ferguson became a Seventh-day Adventist in 1999. She became a Sabbath keeper. She was, she was there living in Port Augusta. She grew up in Alice Springs. I should say she was born in Alice Springs. But she grew up in the very centre of Australia at Fink or Apatula Community. It's just over the South Australian border into the Northern Territory. And that's Fink. That's this Aboriginal community there near the geographical centre of Australia. There you see the mighty Fink River that flows by occasionally. Mostly it's just a dry riverbed. Well, there's a map to show you where it is, right in the centre of Australia. That's where Lorraine grew up. There's the road that goes off the Stewart Highway, 150 kilometres of uh, gravel road that leads there into the Fink community. There one time, George Lamber, Lambiner was with me and there we saw this camel on the side of the road. And you go past the actual sign to the very geographical centre of Australia, the Lambert Centre. And so we continued on and there you see the flat country and at last there is Fink, just a little community. It's a lovely little community. Pastor Davy and I, we first went there in about 2002. And uh, I've been going back regularly ever since over the years. There's the one-stop shop. And there you see the office. Used to be a pub, but today it's the community office. And you notice some of their rules there. Any person who brings grog into Apertula will have their car taken away. They try to keep the grog out. It's not an easy thing because some of the young people, they think that they want to go that way, but at least they try. At one time, they had a pet camel. Somebody rescued it out of the riverbed and it would wander around the community and talk to people and it tried to go to school, but uh, they shut the gate and wouldn't let it in, so it thought it would go cruising and there it's looking at the steering wheel, but... Uh, there you see one of the air-conditioned vehicles up there. And um, there are folk down by the river. You know what they're digging for? They're digging for little onions to put in the stew. These grow under the grass by the riverbed. There you see Emily Churchill with a coolerman that she has carved out of a piece of wood. These were used for carrying babies or carrying quandong or food of various sorts. And there's um, Rosemary Matasia cooking something there in the fire and, uh, and uh, the pastor's there watching what's happening. Julie, uh, Julie um, Anderson there with a big drumstick. That's an emu one. And there's Audrey Braden there cutting up the emu. Well here, you've heard of our Aboriginal folk eating witchetty grubs. You want to see where they find them? They'll dig for roots underneath these little bushes there. They'll look for the roots and there in the roots they'll find this grub. They're eating there the inside of the, uh, the root there. And there's Audrey with a big find of witchetty grubs. My wife there looking at the witchetty grubs. And there's some of the children proudly holding them up. And uh, there's little Aloysius. He's saying, look what I've got. And uh, there he shows us what to do with it. There they are. They'll eat, them, they'll eat them raw or they'll eat them roasted either way. And even the dogs love them. This dog just can't get enough. Well, you know, the, God has provided some interesting things out in the desert there. You ladies... Well, you want shampoo, where do you go? You go to the shop, you buy it. But there, look at this. Sandra Churchill here with some bush shampoo. There's a grass that grows and they dig up the roots. These are the roots of it and you rub it on your hair and it makes your hair thick and shiny. So isn't that wonderful? Maybe Pastor John needs a little bit of this, I don't know. <laughs> I shouldn't pick on him, should I? Maybe some... I need a bit, perhaps. 
But anyway, there it is. You rub it on your head and it makes it thick and shiny. Well, there we are digging for honey ants. And um, there's um, a couple of folk there. Now, digging for honey ants is hard work. There, look, big hole. She's halfway to China, I think, looking for these honey ants. <laughs> look at her down here. You know, it's, it's a lot of exercise that the old people got looking for some of this bush tucker. And there at last they find these honey ants. Now, you don't eat the ant. When you have uh, honey that the bee makes, you don't eat the bees, do you? You just eat the honey that the bee makes. And so the same here. You don't eat the ant, you eat the honey that is stored up here in his abdomen. And it's very beautiful, sweet-tasting honey. There's a big dish of honey ants. You know, after all that digging, oh, I tell you, the people are excited to be able to take home a dish of honey ants. Well, anyway, Lorraine Ferguson, she became an Adventist there in Port Augusta, and so she got on the telephone. There, the public telephone outside of her house. And she rang up her friend there in Fink, in Apatula. Her, more than, and, and so she spoke to her friend Sandra Churchill and she said, Guess what? I have become a Sabbath keeper. I've joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we go to church on Saturday. And Sandra said, Well, you've joined Mummel's Church. That means the Devil's Church because you should go on the first day of the week. And, so, and Lorraine said to her friend Sandra, she said, you have a look in the Bible and see what the Bible says. And that was a good answer, wasn't it? And Sandra said to me, she said, I didn't want to look in the Bible, but I knew I had to look in the Bible. And sure enough, when I looked in the Bible, it said, the seventh day is the Sabbath. And so Sandra became a strong believer in the Sabbath. And there's her sister Evelyn, their old dad. Guess what his name was? Winston Churchill. They said to us, we got Winston Churchill in our community. And they would have a bit of a smile about it as well. But anyway, Sandra decided she wanted to go to Mamaruffa College, our indigenous Bible college in Perth. And so that's it there. And uh, she went along there with uh, Marlene Doolan. This is another lady from the Fink. They were the first two from this community to go to Mamaruffa College. And uh, there, Pastor Laurie Evans, who was our division president at one time, he was helping Marlene with her homework. And then others decided to go. Diane Matasia went. One of the old elders of the community, Violet Doolan, she decided to go to Mama Ruffa College. And there's my wife helping Violet with some of her Mama Ruffa homework. And uh, then uh, Bridget went and Evelyn went. And uh, I want to say a big thank you to our Polish church here in Adelaide, College Park Church. They did a lot in the early years to support our work there in Apatula. They came up on a number of occasions and uh, helped the people and ran programs and so on. And so there you see Marek Yantos with a couple of the, uh, the young people that went to Mama Ruffa College. Silvana here and Sean, they went. And um, there last year we had quite a mob of people who went to Mama Ruffa. And then eventually some of the folks said, or oh, I should say I was there one time and Sabbath was coming. And Sandra said, and this was a long time ago, this was back 2003, and Sandra said, Sabbath coming, isn't it? She said, can we have Sabbath worship? I said, sure, I was staying in one of the houses there, and so we organized Sabbath worship. This was the first Sabbath meeting in the Fink. Sandra was there. Lorraine was up from Port Augusta, this lady that had first shared with Sandra. And Lorraine's husband was there, Marlene, the other one that went to Mama Rafa. Sabbath afternoon, I said to them, now all day, all day Sabbath is God's day. It's all special. So... There we piled a big mob in the back of the vehicle. 
Remember, this was a long time ago. I got the nod from the policeman. He said, yes, you can cart them down to the riverbed like this. Today, I don't think the policeman would allow it. But anyway, there we went down to the riverbed. It was dry. And there we sat in the riverbed and we sang songs. And they asked Bible questions. And we had a very special Sabbath. And there... They, at sunset, we joined a circle, and Sandra, for the first time, prayed in public. She prayed in language and thanked God for the gift of the Sabbath. I tell you, it was a very special moment. We've had lots of lovely meetings there, the children singing, and there this was our first little one that we dedicated to Jesus. You want to see what she looks like today? We were there in the Fink on our way down to uh, Adelaide here. That's, that's little Jasmine now. She's grown up a lovely young lady. And there, Pastor Davy and I, we were back there on another occasion and we dedicated 12 children there all at once, dedicated them to Jesus. Well, there we were invited to take funeral services and... Uh, you know, that um, is always a special honour to be able to connect with the people in these sad times. Our Polish folk, as I mentioned, they came up and supported us. They put up satellite dishes so people could get hope and 3ABN. Uh, we had visiting speakers. Pastor George Quinlan came and uh, spoke to the people. There was a big mob of people that were there when Pastor Quinlan came. And the Polish folk organized Steve Darmody to come from America, to come and to do a three-night concert there in the Fink. And uh, this man, you've seen him on the Voice of Prophecy DVDs, this man really connected with the folk. He said, I've got indigenous blood in my veins. He said, Native American and Afro-American. And he was a pastor. He was not, he's not just an entertainer, he's a pastor. And he, he sang, but he told stories, he, he shared messages, he prayed for the people, and the people really warmed to him. But every opportunity Lorraine got, she was sharing Jesus. She was encouraging the people. She, not just, she didn't just ring Sandra up and say, I've uh, become a Sabbath keeper, and, and say, oh, well, I'll leave it all now to, to her to do whatever she wants to do. So, uh, uh, um, Lorraine took every opportunity to encourage the people. She sent them up DVDs or videos in those days. She was sending up materials. I saw her there one time at the shop and she was sitting there as the people were coming out of the shop and she had this brown paper bag and we thought, what she got in this brown paper bag? She had tracks. She had messages bible messages and as people were coming out of the shop there she's giving them to them there she had a bible study on the subject of the sabbath that she had photocopied copies of and there she was giving them to her friends and her family up there so they could see what the bible said about these various truths christine allen she was hearing people saying Seventh day is the Sabbath, and yet they were brought up Sunday way. And so Christine said one day, I'm a bit confused about all of this. You know, some are saying this and some are saying that. And so she prayed. She said, Lord, can you show me? And so the Lord gave her a dream and she saw darkness all over the Fink community. But then she looked up to the sand hills and there was a light in the sand hills. She said, thank you, Mama, thank you, God. She said, you've shown me that little mob of Sabbath keepers that meet from time to time up in the sand hills. They're the ones, they're, the, they're on the right track. Thank you, God, for showing me. Do you know Christine Allen has now been baptized? Well, there you see some of the people all in a bus. You say they look sleepy-headed. Yes, they are sleepy-headed. We got them up five o'clock in the morning. They were in the bus ready to go all the way to Brisbane for our national Aboriginal camp. And there they got there to the camp in Brisbane. We had a wonderful time. It was the 100th anniversary. 
It was the centenary, I should say, of our Aboriginal work, the Adventist Church's Aboriginal work for Australia. And there the Fink Mob got up on the platform and there they sang in language. I tell you, it was a special moment. And at that camp, we baptised the first one from Apertula. It was Evelyn Churchill. Well, by and by, the folk said to us, we need a Sabbath-keeping church up here. Many of us now believe the Sabbath. We would like to have a Sabbath-keeping church. And so we talked to the community and they sold us this huge block of land. Guess how much? $2,000. And uh, so there... A team of builders came in 2012, headed up by Athel Grossi from Western Australia. And there they worked for a month. It was freezing cold. There were, it, the temperatures were down to zero at night. But they worked. And then they had to go away for a month and they came back. And that time it was hot. They were there in 40, 45 degree heat building the church but in two months there they built a sabbath keeping church a seventh day adventist church there in apatula community and then we had the opening day there's some of the pastors there beside the sign which says that this church is uplifting the lord jesus as our only savior and the bible as the word of god and so we had the opening ceremony. We had Friday night, we had Sabbath morning, we had Sabbath afternoon, we had Saturday night. It was a grand weekend, it really was. And uh, guess what happened on that weekend that we did opened and dedicated the church? Sandra Churchill, that one that Lorraine had rung up those many years before, she was baptised. And there I had the privilege of baptising Sandra and Marlene, the first two that went to Bible college. And so that was the first baptism in the church there, in the Sabbath-keeping church there in the Fink. We made an appeal. We baptised the four people. We made an appeal. There were about 21 people who came forward saying, we also would like to be baptised. And during the opening ceremonies, we called Lorraine and Daryl up the front. And I said to them, ladies and gentlemen, we wouldn't have this church here if it wasn't for this shy little lady who shared her love of Jesus and her love of the commandments and her love of the Sabbath with her family and her friends back up there in the Fink. And as I said, she didn't just make one phone call or send one DVD she was there encouraging them all the way along. And as the result today, we have this lovely church there. I went back and ran an evangelistic series there. And uh, inside the new church, we have a volunteer, Mansell Doherty, that's uh, living there and encouraging the people. And the next year, 15 more people were baptised and 10 more responded to the appeal to prepare for baptism. And so there we had this beautiful baptism. There's one of the older men being baptised. You want to see his face when he came up out of the water? You look. A big smile on his face that he'd made his commitment to Jesus. And... And John Kemp comes regularly there to the meetings. He's always there at the church meetings. And so there, young mum, Susan Doolan, young people like Benedict Hayes and a young, uh, young girl like Delina James there and another young mum, Roxanne Churchill, young men like Geoffrey Stewart, who's now been to Mama Ruffa College, Geoffrey has. And then Pastor John Beck went up last year and there they baptised another nine people there at the Fink. Pastor John led out there with the baptism. And so we praise God for what has happened up there. And it's, it's largely due to this shy little lady who made a commitment to the Lord Jesus and then she shared what was in her heart, what she had discovered about Jesus and the Bible with her family and friends 
and God has blessed it in a marvelous way. Lorraine's husband, Darrell, he said to me one day, years ago, he said, can I go to Bible college? I thought, why would he want to go to Bible college? He's never even been to church. Why does he want to go to Bible college? Well, I said, I guess you can. And so he signed up to come to Mama Ruffa College. And there he is sitting up there in Mama Ruffa College at Bible College. When he got there, he was that shy. He hardly would say hello to people. But he was there. And the Holy Spirit began to work on his heart. And then he came back to Port Augusta. And guess what? He started coming along to church. Then he started helping with the children's programs. And then came the day of his baptism. He made his choice for Jesus. I remember Lorraine, his wife, that quiet, shy little lady I was talking about. She'd said to me, she said, I wish my husband were a Christian man. I said, well, Lorraine, you pray for him. Pray for him. And you know, I'm happy to tell you that he is Christian man today. There he got baptized. And uh, now, and then he's been to Bible college. And, uh, and Daryl has a burden that his people are ready for Jesus to come. Just like his wife, he wants to see people choosing Jesus, following his commandments, respecting and honoring his Sabbath, living for Jesus and being ready for Jesus to come. So God has used these people just like he used Gideon. Gideon was willing and these people have been willing. The question is, are you willing? God can use you. God is waiting to use you. Are you willing for God to use you? That's the question. My dear friends, Take courage. We're living in the time when Jesus is soon to come. No time now to be just busy making money. No time now to be living in ease. It's time now that we share Jesus and uh, we let God use us to share him so that people can be ready for his soon return. Do you want to do that? You put up your hand to this morning if you would like to let God use you and let God work through you to help people to be ready for his coming. You have different talents, you have different abilities, but are you willing to let God use you? Put up your hand if you're willing to let God use you. Yes, I see some people. Yes, I see more people. God bless you. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, this morning... We just want to thank you for the story of Gideon. This shy little man who was afraid to, to go forth. He went forth at night in the first instance. But then bit by bit, he gained courage as he put his trust in you and as he saw your hand. And Lord, you did a mighty work through Gideon. A wonderful work. He could never have done it and we can't do anything on our own. We're so helpless. We can speak to people, but that won't bring conviction to them. It's your Holy Spirit that brings conviction. But Lord, this morning, we're willing. You've seen the hands of people here this morning that say, Yes, God, use me to help people to be ready for your coming. Use each one here according to their talents and abilities that you have given to them. Use them. May they be fully committed to you. May they be willing. And I pray, Lord, this morning publicly that you will lead them to people that are wanting to know more about you, that are open to learn about you, that you'll lead the people here in the church this morning, to such seeking people, and that you'll lead people to our members here so that they can share Jesus, that you'll give us all the right words, and may people be delivered from the power of sin and the devil and turn to Jesus and to his ways and be ready for his coming. And so, Lord, bless each one of us here today. May we go forth 
in, in your strength, with your courage, to the glory of your name. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, Ancient world.